It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other Wednesday at the Ann Arbor District Library, lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the corner of 5th and William, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about comics, making comics, uh, the, the lifestyle of cartoonists, what, it go- what goes into making these uh, things, this medium that drives us all mad. And my name is Jersey Drozd, and with me today... I just realized today that it's been a year since you were an official guest on the show, Raina Telgemeier of GoRaina.com. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> I, I was looking on, on, uh, on Skype and it said last message one year ago. And uh, I was like, wow, has it really been that long? But I was talking with um, my wife about how, you know, as we were driving her to work today. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to have Raina on the show. Uh, and she closed out. Last year's show, she was in the final episode of 2011. Now she's in the final episode of 2012. And I was like, God, oh, it'd be really cool if that was like a, a tradition. And Anne said, you mean like the Queen's Christmas address to, to the UK? And I was like, yes! That, <laughs> that's a great idea. It, it, I can't think of anybody better to give the yearly Christmas or, Chris, or seasonal uh, comics address than Raina Telgemeier, uh, author of so many books like Drama and The Babysitter's Club. And, uh, oh, yeah, you did this other thing called Smile that I guess some people like. Some, yeah, yeah. <laughs> little <laughs> comic thing that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> so, uh, Raina, we're going to, you're going to be in the, the hot seat today. We're going to be in the spotlight. You are our single subject today. And with me, the other guest, is actually my co-host this week, Cassie. Cassie, who's uh, you know missing school to be here. And I, I don't know how to feel about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I did that when I was a kid. I told you the email, right? I was like, when I was a kid, I went on uh, a local TV show during lunchtime. Uh, to, and, and it was it, not only was it excused, but I was like a minor celebrity for a day. As all the kids were like, wow, you're on TV. <laughs> it was a bigger deal back then to actually be on TV than it all is right, now. So Cassie's our celebrity co-host. Celebrity co-host. <laughs> yeah, celebrity yeah. co-host. And, and, and Cassie, uh, just to give background on this, uh, this was part of a contest that we ran, what, back in September, yeah? Uh-huh. The Drama Day contest, uh, which, uh, you know, you announced that a winner uh, of the contest would get to co-host this show and uh, interview you on on the show. And Cassie won. And boy, what an entry she made. Because like the contest essentially was like take a picture of yourself with drama on the day of release. Right. Or create fan art or do a blog post. And everybody entered that way. But Cassie, you dressed up as the main character from the show. I just kind of felt a connection to her. I don't know. It's just like our names kind of match and our hair at the time was a little bit matchy. Like my hair used to have purple streaks in the front, but now it's fading. <laughs> yeah. It's, so It was perfect. Yeah. It, it, it was really cool. It was, it, you, you made a good Cali. Uh, it, I, I I thought that was I was hoping that people would cosplay on the day of release, and uh, fortunately, some a few guys did. That was really cool. So anyway, so what I'm going to do now is I am going to step back. I got a ton of questions to talk about uh, with this book drama, and I've been talking about it all year on and off. But I'm glad that we get the opportunity to do an entire episode about this book. Uh, but I want to hand the reins over to Cassie because you said that you prepared a bunch of questions to interrogate Raina with. Yeah, um, a oh, little bit. <laughs> uh, actually, um, and, and just before we go into that, uh, Raina, did you is now the time to actually play the trailer so we can introduce for for oh, the yeah for, let's let's play the book trailer for so, drama. So so for those f- f- you know poor souls who have not heard of this book, <laughs> here's the introduction. Matt, you want to pull it up? I've always loved the theater, but I figured out pretty fast that I fit in best behind the scenes. Now I'm in charge of set design for my middle school play. It's a dream come true! Except... What? My amazing idea for a prop might be a misfire. The cast and crew aren't exactly getting along. Not to mention, I don't know if I still like the guy I thought I liked. And I'm not sure if the guy I think I like likes me. Talk about drama! Okay, so that was the trailer <laughs> that, uh, for drama that you can find on YouTube or at GoReina.com. Uh, and that, that, that pretty much introduces us to the gist of the story. So with that out of the way, now I can hand it over to Cassie, and you can take the driver's seat. You could be the host for a while. And, uh, you know, what, what questions would you uh, throw at Reina on behalf of young people everywhere? 
Oh, okay. So, um, first I just want to say that, like, everyone in my family has read this book so far, except for my little sister who's nine, but that's because <laughs> we felt she should be a little bit older before she read it. And we all, like, we really liked it and stuff, but I was wondering, like, were there any people who, like, in your life who inspired these characters or something, or they just come yes. out of your head? That is, that is, uh... Probably the most, for me anyway, interesting thing about this book is that even though the story is fiction, <clears throat> because I was not on the stage crew in middle school, and my name is not Callie, and I don't have terrible <laughs> hair, um, when I was in high school, I was super good friends with these two twin boys, mm -hmm. and their names are Jake and Jeff, and they are both super duper talented, and they're both actors, singers, I don't think they really dance, but if they could, they would. And um, I became really, really good friends with the two of them and kind of started to have feelings for one of them. And it was pretty much a whole year that we spent together. Me sort of like really, really wanting to be his girlfriend and him sort of not acting like he wanted to be my boyfriend. Um, and that turned out to be because he was gay. And uh, so that's kind of the story of these characters in drama as well. And um, so the story of these three characters and their friendship is very much inspired by a real friendship that I have. And these two people are still super good friends of mine to this day. And the three of us are always talking about, you know, that was such a good time we had in high school. And oh, wasn't it crazy how the three of us did this together and we used to go out and like eat at fast food restaurants and we used to ride around in the car together. Like, so all these, all these experiences uh, of a friendship made their way into the story. And I think that sort of represents the emotional core of drama, if not necessarily like what the characters actually do in the story. How, so how, they definitely are. How do they feel about being favorite characters now amongst readers? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know about that, but I, I had them both read the drafts of the story before I actually drew it. And so I was able to sort of get their opinions about whether I was telling it in a way that felt true to all three of us. And fortunately, they agreed with me that it was it was something special and worth putting out there. So I think I think the three of us just look at it as like sort of a fictionalized version of a friendship. Whether or not that makes the characters uh, fan favorites or anything... I don't even think that's really, I don't know, maybe it's occurred to them. I haven't talked to them about that. Okay. Uh, it's like, it's when I was reading the book, it's like uh, uh, Justin like really jumped out at me. And I was like, I love this guy. I want to spend yeah. all my time around this guy. Uh, so, and I was thinking there's probably other people who think that too. Like, God, I wish I had a friend like Justin or Jesse, you know? Uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't know if they've, if that has even occurred to them yet. Uh, but you can, you can, well, I'll ask them. Okay. <laughs> we'll have them on at the end of next year. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Actually, uh, so Callie, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to step on you. What, what, Cassie. What? Cassie. 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 See? Look. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Um, we'll keep doing that. It'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, you said that um, you never were part of the stage crew. Did you do anything with, like, acting and stuff, like, when you were in high school? Or was it all just kind of... Yeah. In fact, I did it in middle school too, but um, when I was working on Smile, I was, I was doing my best to sort of focus the story on just my teeth and my friends. But I mean, that's not all I did when I was in middle school. I did join um, like after school drama club and participated in the plays that my school was putting on. And in one case, my, my middle school, I think I was in seventh grade, we actually wrote our own play and like directed it and presented it. And I played a nerd called Molly Sankensteimer, and I made this character up. And it was great because I was able to actually wear my headgear as part <laughs> of the character on stage. Um, and so that was, that was really fun. And then when I was in high school, I participated in all of my school musicals. And that's a lot of where drama really comes from is I never played a leading role. I was always one of the background characters or part of the ensemble, which is just a group of people that like plays small roles in the backgrounds. And the roles are usually so small that you're only on stage for like one or two songs for the entire play. Mm -hmm. And you spend the rest of your time backstage kind of waiting for cues and participating in all of the insanity that goes on behind the scenes in a play. 
Yeah. And that is so much fun. And so many amazing friendships kind of came out of that experience. And just watching like the stage crew play pranks on the actors and, you know, watching people try to find their costumes and a big pile of stuff and going into prop rooms. And um, yeah, so it was it was a really big part of my life when I was a teenager. Wow. Wow. I did not <laughs> realize this. Um, Cassie, have you seen The Princess Diaries? Um, I've seen the second one. <laughs> or, or, or read the books, for that matter. They were books first. But, like, yeah, there's, know. there's like, this stereotype sometimes of, and I'm not saying Princess Diaries is that, because I actually enjoyed, I enjoyed the movies. A grown man did. Uh, Julie Andrews was great in them. But um, there's a stereotype about, like, fiction for young girls where it's like, oh, she's a nerd, and then she takes off the glasses, and she's beautiful, and now you're the queen of the prom and everything, and now you get to be the lead singer in a rock band, and now you get to drive a car, and then you act like a snob, and you, you, you diss your friends, and then you learn what real friendship is, and then you become a good guy going to hang out with your nerd friends, right? Um, drama is so interesting because Callie is not the star of the play. She is the background character. She is she's literally a production in the behind the scenes and the stars are there as characters, but we're really focusing on this this heroic journey of this young girl and all the stress and anxiety and and ups and downs of somebody who doesn't get often celebrated. And I didn't know that this came from again personal experience right now. I thought this was just you being clever saying like, well, you know, I'm gonna flip this thing a little bit and not make the 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 Hannah Montana character the main character of this thing, but actually focus on a production person. Yeah. I mean I, I never felt like I was the main character in my life. I always felt like I was somebody who was just watching from the side. And I think as an artist and a writer and a storyteller, I was okay with that role because I felt like my job in life was just to kind of observe what was going on around me and then use that as fodder for the stories that I was going to tell. So sort of like <laughs> I always knew other people were the stars of the show and that I was just like a, a background role in other people's lives. But I don't know. I guess I guess you could call that turning a story on its head and making well, people in the background the main character. Right. Well, I'm I'm, I'm just it, it's. See, this is just another example of why you were such a great person and author at the same time, is that doing that kind of thing just comes naturally to you. It's not a trick. It's not you be like, I'm going to turn the whole thing on, the whole world on its head, and you take nothing for granted. It's just, this is who you are. This is this is why your work comes across as being so genuine. And I, and I would imagine this is probably partially also why in the story, Callie is, she's not just a simple cut-out nerd character or anything like that. She is... She's in the back making it happen, but there's no bitterness. She's crazy passionate about that stuff that's going on behind the scenes. Uh, yeah. And, and th th there's a scene where Callie uh, sort of auditions for a part as, as a way to cajole one of her friends into auditioning for a part. And she intentionally does this terrible job of it. You know, and she does this big bow at the end, you know, because she knows that that's not what she's cut out for. And she's cool with that. I think that's an awesome character to present to young people. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> So, I unintentionally did that in sixth grade. You did? <laughs> yeah, in sixth grade, I tried out for the school play. Um, I thought about doing it this year because it was The Little Mermaid, but in sixth grade, it was Beauty and the Beast, and I tried out, and I tried. It It really was kind of horrific as I look back on it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, but this year, instead, I helped with a little bit of set design, which was kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome what kind of sets did you guys make for oh, um, lots of like fish and stuff and like seaweed and then we had i think i like kind of left before they were done but i think it was supposed to be a castle Ooh. but i'm not sure yet that's awesome and you yeah. guys haven't have you put is the play been on yet or is it coming? oh no it doesn't go on for a couple months <laughs> okay oh, and i'm not like gonna do much more i just painted some sets so with art just. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, just. I mean, that's that's a lot of people that are going to be able to see your work when it goes right. up, right? And, that, and I'm sure it's a lot of work. I, I, I'm sure that the scenes of Callie being exhausted in the book ring true to you when you were working on that uh, stage production stuff, right? Oh, there were a lot of people there helping, so it wasn't really that much. <laughs> we just were, like, filling in lines and picking colors. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, did you have any other questions, Cassie? Oh, yeah. Um, well, like, for the um, drama book, you said, that, like, when did you start thinking that you were going to write this book? Like, how long did the process take you? Um, I mean, I started thinking about the story before I was done with Smile. So, if you want a timeline, 
Um, I started Smile in 2004, and it started going up online in 2004. It was like the spring. And then the book was done in 2009, and it was published in 2010. And right after I finished writing Smile in the summer of 2009, um, I just started thinking about, you know, what what was going to come next. And I sort of knew that it was going to be this story, but I hadn't written it yet. But I knew because um, my head was so in Smile. Like, I was thinking so much about Smile and the story and my life at that time. And in my actual life, after the events in Smile were done, I got my braces off. I had my sophomore year of high school. The year after that was... Actually, no, it was later that year was when I met my two friends, Jake and Jeff. So so drama is actually sort of like a spiritual sequel to Smile in a lot of ways. People are always like, what did you do after Smile ends? I'm like, well, you know, I joined the choir and I joined uh, drama at my school and I met all these cool people and we had all these really exciting times together. So it's almost as if drama is the sequel to Smile. It's just that I took the characters and changed their names and put them in middle school instead of high school. So it sort of it just sort of felt like the the logical next step for me. And um, it was one of a couple of projects that I started working on. I started writing drama, and I also started working on um, a couple of anthology pieces. And my husband Dave and I sort of had this idea for like a future project that we want to do. So I was also working on some of that. Jersey has this look on his face like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the one project I started focusing on right after Smile, but it sort of took shape faster than anything else and sort of took over my brain faster than everything else. So I think I started, yeah, I started writing it in the summer of 2009. I probably finished the first draft um, in the spring or summer of 2010. And then had to rewrite it because actually I did write it as a high school story originally. Mm-hmm. It was a story about high school kids. And then I was asked to try rewriting it to be about middle school kids. So it took me another, you know, six months to write that treatment. And so the project ended up taking about a year to, to write. Mm-hmm. And then once we were satisfied, and we being me and my editors, once we were all satisfied with the story, that's when I started to draw it. So I think altogether, it was about a year to write and a year and a half to draw. And all together, two and a half years. And that means I finished it at the beginning of this year. So it was the very, very beginning of 2012. I finished the artwork and then it was published in September. So that's the timeline. I, I wish I could work faster. I, I was going to say, that... I was gonna say what, where's, where's the next book? Because, I mean, this came out. I've read it. I've read it six times. Uh, yeah, where, where's the it's... next book, Raina? Come on. Chop, chop. Mm, I'm still working on the script for my next book. Um, I'm supposed to give my editor a treatment at the beginning of January. So it, it it's it's heartbreaking how long it takes to make these things to make them right. At any well, rate, right? I mean, I could I could move, make them faster, but they wouldn't be good. Exactly. Okay. Or I mean, I could just go with the first draft of the current script that I'm working on, which was done in September. But my editor was like, you know, there's there's a lot of things that you could do to make this stronger. And I always want to make my work as strong as possible. And it's part of why working with an editor is so fantastic, is they really push you to do things as best as you can. Because, you know, I don't, I don't want to disappoint Cassie with my... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <or anything. laughs> uh, can, can I ask a dumb question real quick? There are no dumb questions, Jersey. Oh, okay. Well, uh, the, the, my approach to this may be dumb. Uh, Cassie, do you want to turn to page 188 of the book? Can I do that too? Robert? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, because it, it, just so we all know the scene I'm talking about, because I'm going to have to be a little bit uh, oblique about it because mm. it would be giving away some spoilers of oh, the story. Spoilers. Uh, <laughs> yes. Oh. But there's, there, <laughs> it's a great scene, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but but what I'm really interested in is in page 189. Okay, and this is like this whole idea of the play as a model for life. There's this great line. This big thing happens in the play. This big thing happens in the play and the audience is aghast and then someone says uh oh who is this is this greg no this isn't this is greg's brother who says what's going on in the house and callie says a couple of people are laughing up front and then the director says this let them laugh this show's not stopping for them now this thing that the that some people are laughing at is kind of it depends on your point of view whether or not it's a laughable thing but i love this line let them laugh. This show's not stopping for them. And I thought this is another one of those things where it could be construed as a life message. Like the play, a play is like life. 
And weird things happen, goofy things happen, or unexpected things happen, dramatic things happen, and if some people might laugh at you when that happens. But you don't stop for people who laugh at you. Was that an intentional thing, Raina, or am I just reading way too much into your words? <laughs> um, you know, I don't. I don't usually have intentions when I'm writing stories. And um, one of the things I will say that people have sort of asked me over and over since this book was published, and people are sort of speculating about this on the internet, is whether I was trying to sort of like deliver a social message of some sort. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because it's a book about twins, and it's about gay guys. And so people are wondering if I have some sort of nature versus nurture agenda, or if I'm trying to... I'm like, I have no agenda. I had these friends, and I basically am telling a story about my friends. And, um, you know, when I'm writing a story, I'm not thinking about how people are going to read that story. I'm just thinking about how it makes me feel and what feelings I'm trying to get across. It's it's like 99% feeling for me and 1% everything else. <laughs> so if it comes across as like, wow, what a profound moment and what a wonderful uh, message you've communicated to the world. I'm like, hey, bonus. <laughs> and so so again, this is just this just comes from the heart. This is naturally yeah. who you are, these messages. Ah. So... And I think it's having been through theater and through productions of plays, it's like, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out what people would say in a situation and that's it. Well, it, it, it came across that way. It came across as a real, like, you know, this is a classic moment in literature to me is, <laughs> is how it felt to me. Uh, so I, 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 I thought this was really cool. And I mean, if you, if you break it down, it's like, yeah, like the, all the stuff that's happening in trying to make this play work is such a metaphor for everything else. Like, you know, Bonnie has a meltdown. The, there's a problem with the canon. Uh, the, the shocking moment at the end of the play. And the director says, keep moving. Right. I just thought uh, uh, lovely. So uh, I'll, 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 I'll pitch it back to Cassie before I start crying. <laughs> uh, I had a question like relating you to Callie. Um, like, oh, uh, have you ever stolen anything from the prop closet like she did with that dress? Because, I mean, I've always had temptations to do things like that, but have you ever done something like that? Careful. Uh, no. I have not. Have you thought of doing that? Yeah. I mean, I don't think in the story Callie was supposed to steal the dress. I think in my head it was more like she and Liz probably – went to Mr. Madeira and were like, hey, is it cool if we borrow this prop? We're going to return it to you. We're not going to get anything on it or anything. And he he just respects them and trusted them enough to do it. But that's an interesting thought that they just, like, took it and didn't ask. Um, I've never personally done anything like that. But, I mean, the temptation of seeing all these amazing outfits and all these amazing things. Um, I actually went to... A private school in the Bronx to take all of my reference photos for this book and they were very very kind to let me photograph their stage and their backstage and their prop closet and so most of what you see in the prop closet in the book is based on what's in the prop closet at the school and it was just awesome like they had the best prop closet I've ever seen and it was just like oh man this thing is so awesome and look they obviously made this thing from scratch and it looks so perfect but you know, it's a lot of just like old stuff. It's kind of like going in into, into an antique shop and just like blue <laughs> candlesticks and like strange baskets and interesting feather boas and things. And so, yeah. you know, that would have been really horrible if I had stolen their stuff. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, took all, I just took pictures of everything. So for me, it's like I don't even need to own it. I can just draw it and put it in a story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so did, did you keep a diary when you were a kid, Raina? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. My, my, next, my next question was, is, uh, you know, how do you find do you the good parts of this life experience stuff to put in a book? Is this just like these are the memories that shine out? Well, you mentioned that you had conversations with your friends and like, oh, remember this, remember that. But yeah. I was also wondering, like, for, for the young person who's looking at your work going like, I got to do that. Uh, did, did, were there any special things that you look back on? It's like, oh, I'm so glad I did that when I was a kid because that helped me with the book now, like keeping a diary or you talked about taking reference photos. Yeah, I mean, I, I kept a diary and I also had a drawing journal, which means that every single day I would sort of doodle or draw a comic about what had happened to me that day. So I have like 
thousands of really boring pages of me just like talking to people in German class or something, just, you know, really stuff that doesn't matter in the long run. But at the time it was like, this was my day. This is what happened to me. This is what I drew about. Um, And I feel like it's harder when you're younger to have perspective on your life as a whole and like what has happened to you in that life. And I mean, it depends on the person, but I didn't have anything really major happen in my life until I was in middle school. And for me, that was my whole dental experience. But that's not to say that there weren't things that happened to me when I was younger that I also remember. Um, so like a lot of it comes from looking at old photographs from my family and being like, oh, haha, that time we went to Disney World and my brother got really sick in the car and this thing happened and then the car broke down. It's like these little like family history stories that you share with people that sort of stand the test of time like that to me is is what's going to make a better story than just oh that one time we went to the supermarket and we bought a bunch of different kinds of cereal and we only liked (laughs) two of them and then we didn't buy the other kinds after that like that's not necessarily a great story but and also for me I think there's there's a difference between short stories and long stories like I wrote a lot of short stories pre-smile um some of which are on my website now that are just kind of like moments in time like little moments that I remember but when it comes to writing a longer story, I feel like it needs a little bit more to it. It needs to have an arc. It needs to have sort of a resolution at the end. Um, it needs a lot of other things. And I don't know if I could have done that myself until I was a little bit older. But, yeah, where was I going with this? Um, well, <laughs> well, it, it started with asking, like, where do you find the good parts? And I've got, like, a yeah. follow-up sort of closer uh, closure on that is um, – I, I was just talking about this with your husband on a little show that he and I do called The Kids Comics Revolution. Uh, ask for it by name, kidscomicsrevolution.com. It's a good show. Uh, uh, yeah, Raina did the the album art for the show, okay. so there's a, a more reason to look uh, to check it out. But um, <laughs> one of the things that we talked about was an experience that I had as a young person where uh, a visiting author made a point of, sh- of telling me that uh, a good author uh, finds the humor in their pain. Uh, and, I, and it, it stuck with me. I mean, here I am, you know, 30 years later, and it's, I'm still thinking about that point. And as I'm reading this, too, I'm thinking, you know, a lot of the stuff that y- you've, uh, you know, reported has come from real life probably really sucked at the time when you were going through it, <laughs> uh, especially at the end, at the dance. Uh, there's, there's, there's a scene in the bathroom. You know the scene in the bathroom we're talking about, Cassie? When, when, when yeah. Callie's like, she has like a little bit of a meltdown. And I mean, you want me to find it? <laughs> yeah, we, we can actually look for the page. Uh, oh, here we go. It's page it 204. <laughs> and, yeah, and it, you know, 204 ish. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, I'm sure these things hurt at the time. And so I, I'm also thinking, like, you know, you're talking about like, oh, well, you know, keeping like a drawing journal or, or a diary or something, but also having a sense of, and this is obviously, this is, this is like easy for us to say as grown ups, is that guess what, kid, afterwards? You get a good story out of it, so maybe that'll help uh, balm the the drama of the moment. But uh, I just think that that's that's worth unboxing there a little bit. Or am I wrong on this, Reina? That uh, finding the humor and the sweetness in the pain is part of an author's job. Um, certain kinds of authors. I mean, I know there's authors who don't have happy endings and don't yeah. like to focus on sort of the positive outcome of an experience, but. I don't think I'm one of those authors myself. And I think that humor is a really, really powerful tool in storytelling and can sort of help transcend moments and can bring uh, a really personal moment into the sort of universal sphere. Because if you can laugh at something, that means you can probably relate to it in some way. Like most, most of the humor that I appreciate comes from like, Oh, I've been there. Oh yeah. I know how that is. And so, um, yeah, I think it's really important. If you're going to write a story about something horrible, you don't just want to make everybody feel terrible. It's, it's more <laughs> fun to read it if it's got something. So the first draft of drama was just you at, squealing in pain as like people were messing around with your mouth, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then that, that just looked at the camera. It just sucks, kids. That's all. The well, I, I mean, Cassie, you're, you're 13. Like, if you were going to write a story about a time in your life, like, what would you pick? Or would you... Mm, I'd probably, like, since I do synchronized swimming and I had some issues where three years in a row teammates quit on me so I couldn't go to nationals and I qualified and stuff. And then, like, after finally getting to go there, and I've gone there twice now, so that was exciting. 
yeah. we didn't do very well, but we represented our team well. Yeah, you got to go. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, it was fun. So you, you, I mean, if, if you were to do a story about that, would you focus on like eventually getting there? Would you focus more on feeling defeated because you didn't get to go? Getting there. Would you focus getting there? Yeah, so yeah get, definitely. <laughs> you know, stories with endings. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And I know a lot of people that are experiencing something at the moment. Sometimes it feels as it feels like that thing is never going to end, but most things do. That was our "it gets better" moment. Yeah. Of, of this episode <laughs> of Comics Are Great. So, Cassie, uh, what else do you got for Raina? Well, um, this is just kind of something that happened at school. Like right now, we're going through our book club, a uh, book fair, yeah, book our school book fair, and we had huh? a bunch of your. We had a bunch of copies of Smile and a bunch of copies of Drama, and none of them were there today. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. I also could successfully convince several people to buy it after they read the first page and kept pointing at it and laughing at it with their friends. So they were all like, look, no, it's funny. Really? <laughs> what's it was really funny. Awesome. Cassie, yeah, Cassie and... what's one of your favorite scenes in the book? Mm. Ah, I know, right? Oh. Put you on the spot. Like, yeah, what's, <laughs> what's your favorite candy, right? It's like, ah, what? Don't don't make me pick. <laughs> mm. Well, I don't know. I like I like the scene where he she meets like the twins and Justin's just kind of bouncing off the walls. <laughs> and, yeah. and and when she first meets them, how they're kind of like hovering over her yeah. as she's looking at the paper and all this <laughs> you can almost hear that that cartoon noise of that uh, like the violin yeah. noise as they're hovering over her. Yeah, those two I wish comics could have sound effects sometimes. Yeah. Funny you should mention that because one of the things I noticed on page 128 that I thought well, I was like, ah, Raina, you know, it's like I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a sound nerd in comics. I love sounding comics. And I always feel like when people don't use sound a lot, it's a missed opportunity. <laughs> but here comes Raina to slap me upside the head like a pro wrestler and say, no, 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 no. You could do stuff without sound that's really awesome. Uh, the scene where they go to the, um, oh, what is this place? It's like a costume uh play warehouse kind of store thing page 128 page 129 mm -hmm. Irena you did a musical montage without <laughs> music it's it's this silent scene of them going around looking at all the cool stuff in this place and it's a straight up as i was watching or reading it watching it, guys, it watching was like it was, it. yeah i know it's like it was moving in my <laughs> mind i'm hearing music playing in the background this is like a musical montage scene from a film right and you did that, it, like, you intentionally, like, here she is squealing over, um, and I don't know if anybody can see that on camera, she's squealing over, like, a, a book that she just found, and it's just, like, the heart with the exclamation points, right? We know that sound. Uh, <laughs> but you didn't actually spell the sound or anything like that. This was, this was really, really cool. I, I'd have to say this is probably one of my top ten moments of the book. Was where top ten? Yes, <laughs> top ten. Well, that's another scene where... Um... Like I, I inked it. I mean, I, I drew it and then I inked it and then I got the colors back from the colorist. I was just like blown away. Like they, they really brought more of a mood to it than I had even conceived of and just, you know, put all this light and all this atmosphere into it. And so, yeah, working with the colorist is really an exciting thing. And the colorist is Gurihiru, who is a two woman art team in Japan. Um, and they work with a translator who speaks English because they don't. And um, they just, I mean, they are currently doing Gene Yang's adaptations of the Avatar comics. Yeah. And, oh, hello. Um, <laughs> and they have done all sorts of awesome stuff for Marvel. And they're just like some of my favorite cartoonists out there. So it was really exciting to work with them as the colorists of this book, too. How much of a say did you get in the coloring, like, picks and stuff? Like, um, I mean, I sent them, like, a color key in the beginning and said these are going to be all of the character colors. And um, this scene should be nighttime. This scene should be really, you know, dark because they're backstage. But, um, you know, it was, it was really a lot of their own sensibilities. And if mm -hmm. they would send me something that wasn't quite right, I'd be like, oh, could you just redo this like this? But some, in some cases, I would just, like, take the file and be like, I really wanted her to have green pants here. So I would just read <laughs> them green or something. But um, so it was a collaboration. But they're, they're great. So they made a lot of fantastic choices that I wouldn't have even known what to do with myself. And then they just send it back. And I'm like, oh, this is perfect. Awesome. Cool. 
Yeah, they're they are crazy talented cartoonists. Guru Hero. Uh, check out their Power Pack stuff they did for Marvel. Oh my gosh, their like... Power Pack stuff's amazing. Oh yeah, yeah. So okay, uh, Cassie. Yeah. Um. Hmm. Let's see. What next? Um. Who was like your main like creator inspiration? Like I know you were. Well, I've read that you were really inspired by like the Little Mermaid and stuff. But was there anything else that like? just made you decide that you wanted to be a cartoonist or yeah I mean the first the first comics I discovered were in the newspaper and mm -hmm. those were Calvin and Hobbes and for better or for worse and Luann and Foxtrot and Gary Larson's The Far Side and um, Dennis the Menace so if it was in my newspaper I loved reading it and just kind of never stopped reading comics in the newspaper like I did it until I stopped getting a newspaper in college. And then it was, it was amazing. My dad would actually cut out every single comics page from my hometown newspaper. And he saved me these stacks of the comics pages so that I could go home at Christmas time or whatever and like read like four months worth of entire funny pages from the newspaper. Um, <laughs> and then of course, like now comics are serialized online so I can just go to go comics or something and keep up with my favorite strips that way. But um, yeah, comic, comic strips have been a really important part of my life since I was nine. And they're, they're the thing that made me want to be a cartoonist in the first place. Um, I still draw tons of inspiration for them. If I need a boost, I'll just go pick up one of my old Calvin and Hobbes collections and read it and just marvel over again at the brilliance of it. But, um, you know, it was, it was that. And then I started reading alternative comics when I was a little bit older and started just kind of being a sponge when I was in high school and college and just soaking up everything that people sent my way. But you, you mentioned the Disney movies. Those are also really big. <laughs> I wanted to be a mermaid. <laughs> I think we've all felt that way. I think I still want to be a mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's going into the tease for this episode. <laughs> um, what, what's the, if Disney films? I want to get the Raina Telgemeier playlist of Disney cartoon films. What's what's the top three? Top three, if you can pick them. Uh, Dumbo, Little Mermaid, Pinocchio, and Oliver and Company. <laughs> oh, really? Oliver and Company? Cool. I just, yeah, I saw that at the right time, and it was... I think I was 11 when that movie came out and it was around the time I was just like, I just really want to go to New York, man. I just want to move to New York city. And like, that place is so awesome. And I want to live there someday. And that movie came out and just like solidified for me that I had to move to New York someday. Um, <laughs> and I love, I love like the nineties era Disney films. So like the Lion King and Aladdin, um, and even Pocahontas and the Hunchback of Notre Dame and, some of the ones that people frown on as being like less than great. I'm like, what are oh. you talking about? Hunchback of Notre Dame is awesome. Very, um, very scary. Yeah. I love Move On. Like it's, I don't know. I have a hard time, but, but Dumbo and The Little Mermaid are the two that I just can't ever leave off of a top three or top five list because they're oh. so crucial to me. And we just watched Dumbo again like a week ago, and it was just like, oh, this movie's perfect. <laughs> it's so wow, amazing. I gotta talk to you about that movie sometime because I don't get Dumbo at all. I think we, <laughs> I think we have to have, you know, remember when Dave and I had that that uh, uh, Chronicles of Narnia versus Harry Potter discussion? Uh, oh. <laughs> I gotta find out what I gotta unbox this Dumbo thing. Uh, for me, it would be Hercules would be number one. I I, I was I was in my twenties and still going to those movies. Uh, you know, Mulan and. Uh, Oh, yeah, Beauty and the Beast and everything. So, Cassie, what about you? What's your top three playlist? Well, definitely Mulan's my favorite because that was, like, the first pro-feminism one. No, yeah. just kind of, like, yay, where they don't get married and she actually gets to, like, fight people and stuff. <laughs> but then after that, um, well, I mean, do the new ones count? Like, the Princess and the Frog's really good and so is Brave and, I don't know. Um, Those count? Older ones. The Lion King's good and... I don't know. It's Better hard to for me to not include Pixar movies now in that list too. Yeah. Like I love Toy Story 2. Like more than one or three or anything like that. For some reason Toy Story 2 is like it's like Dumbo for me. It's like it's like wow. a perfect movie. I love it so much. <laughs> I don't think I've seen that one in years, and I'm, I'll never see Toy Story three ever again. That was just too oh too emotionally rough 
for this kid. But uh, Okay, well, we're getting ready for book recommendations in a second because Erin Helmrich is in the building, and she will come in here with her book recommendations. But before we kick into that, I want to give Cassie the final word. Any other l things that we didn't address, anything that's been burning in your mind, you have to hear it from Raina. What is it that you want to know? Oh, um, I don't think there's anything. I think I got all the things that were burning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> Okay, um, but then then I'll ask you this: uh, What would you tell somebody who's watching this who has not checked out the book yet? Why? I love you. Go check out the book and read it now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I really honestly believe, Raina, that um, you know this is going to sound dumb, and I'm going to embarrass you again, but this this is an important piece of of fiction. This is something that will be remembered for generations, and I think that it, for that reason alone, comics owes you a debt of gratitude for doing this book. I know you just did it because you wanted to do it. You didn't do it to that, I'm going to go help comics or anything like that. But, uh, but as, as I look at this and see all of the lovely, timeless things that you put in here, and I know you stressed about this because you know, you're worried about like all well, you phones, uh, you know, is this going to be out of date after a while? But you know what? This book is absolutely timeless in my opinion, and, uh, and even as a 37 something or other old man i read this multiple times and i got emotional as i was reading this book so i do think it is indeed for everybody who ever went through middle school so, oh, so thanks th thank you for making this book Raina. seriously uh so okay now it's time to think about what books that we want to, what other books besides drama that people should buy uh and to kick that off i'll let you guys think about your picks while i kick it off to aaron helmrick of the ann arbor district library is her mic on Quite yet. There she is. Now okay. we hear her. There's Erin. So, Erin, how are you? I'm good. I knew today was a big day, so I only brought one book. <laughs> I figured you'd be doing a lot of talking. Oh, um, so what do you got? So, this book is its not a traditional graphic novel. It's written by a children's book illustrator, but the story was told by a um, fisherman. It's called Fishing with Gubby, but it is definitely a graphic novel in terms bit. of... Yeah, where are we at? A little bit. There we go. I can't see it. Yeah, there's... Okay. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, definitely told in panels, but basically, um, if you like adventure and you like cats, it's about a fisherman <laughs> named Gubby who travels with his cat <coughs> Puss, and they're in the Pacific Northwest, um, so they're definitely having lots of travels, oh, but it has one of these awesome cool cutaways. cutaways for kids like me who like to stare obsessively at pictures and figure out what's going on. Did you do that with the Richard Scary books when you were yes. a kid? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I even actually had an early version of those books that had the transparencies where uh -huh. you could see, you know, the winter time, and then you pull the chair transparency back and you saw all the animals living in the tree <laughs> and underground. Oh, those are um, the best. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But so anyway, it's a great story. It, Gubby and, and Puss travel. They have adventures with orcas and um, all kinds of different salmon adventures. <laughs> but you actually will learn quite a, lit a lot about fishing as well. So um, a sweet story. Very um, pretty. I love this oversized format, yeah. too. It's nice to see comics, this gigantic mm -hmm. hardcover format. Yeah, I think it'll make it more accessible, you know, to you know, even the picture book audience who didn't pick it up looking for that kind of story. Um, but it's got a lot of good nonfiction bits in it, too. Lots of animals and, and different kinds of information and stuff. So uh, this is in the library's collection? It is. It's about to be. Oh, okay. Yeah, hasn't <laughs> been processed, but about to be processed. So you will be able to find it at <laughs> yes. the Ann Arbor District Library Absolutely. or at your local library, Absolutely. wherever you are, or at finer bookstores everywhere. So Fishing with Gubby. I'm hoping that Gubby has other adventures, so we'll see. <laughs> By by Kim Lafave and Gary Kent. Yeah, Gary Kent is the fisherman. Okay, uh, who wants to go next? Who has something that they want to talk about? That's a comic that they really enjoyed recently. I can go next. Okay. Um, and these are actually taking it way back, but and we already talked about both of these books, but um, people are always curious, like what other books I can recommend for readers who like my books. And I'm like, well, you kind of got to go back to the classics. Um, so I brought like mm -hmm. one of my old for better, for worse collections. And they're still pretty easy to come by. You can order them on Amazon. You can order them off of Lynn Johnston's website, FB or FW.com. And she'll like sell you personalized copies of all 30, however many books there are. But um, the collections from like the years approximately 83 to 93 are just like, 
if smile comes from anywhere, if drama comes from anywhere, it's from these stories and these characters and the characters at these ages. Um, I don't want to say I ripped Lynn Johnston off, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm really drawing from a similar um, place as she was drawing from in those years of her career. And I just absolutely still adore them. And I also brought Luann, which is another comic strip that I've been reading since I was a kid. And it's kind of one of the only like, YA girl centric comics out there. It started out as about a 13 year old girl. Eventually she got to be 16 or so. And I think she's stayed 16 for a while, but it's just about like her trials and tribulations and, and the boys that she has crushes on in school and her older brother being sort of a jerk and her friends and all the things her friends go through. And over the course of time, I mean, they've dealt with some really heavy subjects. Like one of her friends got cancer and one of her, um, friends had to deal with like being a fire at a workplace and you know there's just been like all sorts of crazy storylines but it's it's really good comics it's just really fun reading and the punchlines always made me laugh and so Luann by Greg Evans um seriously worth checking out the books are not as easy to come by as the for better for worse collections but um they're out there so I suggest looking them up Super cool. And, and as far as Lynn Johnson goes, I mean, she was, I mean, even as a kid, I remember looking at her stuff going, what is it about her characters that look so fluid? And yeah. like, and, and years later, I'm looking at them like, oh, it's what she's doing with her ink lines with the hair and the way the hair spills mm-hmm. on the shoulders. But also there's just this kind of really awesome rubberiness to her characters, but it's not yeah. comical. It's not exaggerated to the point of like Popeye. But it's enough to give the characters a little bit of flexibility to make them into these lovable cartoons, but still be real people. I love mm-hmm. her work. Her stuff yeah. is so good. Oh, so good. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, even if you are a practicing cartoonist, uh, a grown up, I think that these are worth uh, looking into and examining. So, uh, Cassie. Well, I've only got like two really good new ones by me. So I've got um, Zebra Fish by um, <gasps> Peter so H. Reynolds. Nice. Which is amazing. <laughs> Trying to fit it in. Yeah. Um, it's basically about a girl who decides she wants to like be a musician. Um, and but it's not physically possible for her in her like life situation and whatnot. And so she tries to create a band at school, and she gathers a lot of people who don't know how to play music, but they still want to help her. And it this really fun story it's got a little bit of cancer stuff in it too which i really like stories that are cancer books so <laughs> what yeah, why, why is that why, why, why what's the what's the, the the thing about that that makes it uh, in, extra interesting to you i don't know it's um fun i like girl, books about girls with purple hair um <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of like and i've Love the Peter H. Reynolds books, and it's just kind of fun that there's an older one now, and yeah. So Zebrafish, and who was the author again? Peter H. Reynolds. Okay, and Aaron's nodding knowingly. This this was like on like the hot list at the ADL. I was actually illustrated by a friend of mine who I don't believe is credited there on the cover, but her name is Renee Carilla. K-U-R-I-L-L-A, and she's also a really fantastic illustrator cartoonist. Mm-hmm. I love that book, too. Yeah. Okay. And I also have, well, I turned into two books, magically. Um, <laughs> I also have Night School by Svetlana Chimakova, which I love. I love all of her books and Drama Con and all that stuff. This one's basically about a witch whose big sister who raised her disappears, and it's just about, like, having to try to find her with all these, like, like um, vampires and mermaids and dealing with new school issues while being magic. And there's a lot of mystery stuff in it, and it's a full quartet, and it's really good. So is, is it like there's an ensemble of characters in this book? It's not just really primary. It's primarily focused on one person, but there's like a, a, a pretty big cast. Is that what you just yeah, said? Yeah, it's a very big cast. It keeps switching from different groups of people, and eventually they'll meet. And it just, yeah. So you're, have, you're looking at different... I have crazy trivia about that book. What's that? I have crazy trivia about Night School. Well, let's hear it. Are you in the back? Like... What? Aren't you in the back? Uh, I thought I saw your name. I... So Svetlana funny. actually came to New York City to yep. do, like, reference photos. Your name's in it. Yeah, she, she shot reference in New York, and she stayed with me when she did that. And so any shots in the character's home 
in the first volume anyway, are actually based on my apartment. <laughs> yeah, and she she did a lot of changes, but she was just like, I need to know like the layout of an apartment and like where this should go. And like, yeah, so so it doesn't like look like my apartment, but it's based on it. So now I now I feel like I've just injected myself into every <laughs> home. But um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, Stellan is awesome, too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so cool. Yeah, so that's know. night school. Is it night spelled N-I-G-H-T? Yeah. It's okay. one word, night school. And word. it's also the Weirn books. What? The which it's books? It says the Weirn books, W-E-I-R-N. Okay. It's what they call witches in the book. So. And again, Aaron is nodding knowingly, so I guess we have this in the collection at ADL <laughs> sounds, as well. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so so all these books are in the library's collection if you are in the Ann Arbor area, but then you can also go to your local library elsewhere. I have a couple picks that should be in every library, and I know that they are. Um, first of all, we're going to take a holiday break after this episode. We're going to come back in the, I think January 9th is when we're due to come back and start broadcasting again. And one of our first guests for next year is uh, Stephen McCraney of Mal and Chad. And so I thought I would take an opportunity to say something about his books so people can brush up on it before uh, we do the show together and I just love his ink style. I love it. It's like, it's like a sort of like a modern day fun Calvin and Hobbes esque kind of story about a boy kid scientist who actually is a kid scientist and causes all sorts of ruckus with his dog. Um, but it's also just, it's just really well illustrated and he's got some great storytelling in the book. And, uh, this is a popular book in the collection, if I'm not mistaken, this one gets yeah. some Cirque. Mm -hmm. So that's a good one for kids. Is it even in the shot? Oh, how there about I put go. it in the shot so people can actually see the work? <laughs> and then my other pick is actually going back to the old Babysitter's Club. Because <laughs> this is when I became a fan of yours, Raina. Um, th this book came out when? When did this first one? 2006. 2006. And I remember yeah. the first time I saw it, because I knew of you. I mean, we we had like seen each other at shows and stuff, but we didn't know each other. And I remember when I saw this, I was like, oh, how awesome. I can't think of anybody better to do these books. So then I went out and got it. And I turned into the un insufferable fanboy for these books. And I'm telling all my friends, have you seen the Babysitter's Club books? Am I ready to talk about it? And everybody's like, oh, you're being ironic. Yeah, it's funny that you're a grown man who loves these books. I'm like, no, I didn't care about these books before, but now I really love them. So, uh, yeah, it, it, so that was the moment where I was like, I got to get to know this gal because these are so well told. So, uh, Cassie, you've read these, right? Or at least seen yeah, these? Yeah, I've read all of them. They're really good, right? <laughs> So even if your introduction to Reina was Smile and then you're moving on to drama, you, there's a whole back catalog of how many of these are in the, in the series? There's four. Four. So there's four more books to check out by Reina, and these are really, really good. So, yes, this is my personal copy that I was shoving down people's throats years ago. So, and um, when you're bringing up more Reina books, don't forget X-Men Misfits. With that's Nate. right. Oh. This one was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I literally, like, I read Smile, and then I was like – on your website looking at your other books and I was like, wait, you have an X-Men book? It's about Kitty Pride. That's like that was like what I was super into at the time, which I still am super into, but like those were like the focus of my life right then. So I was like, what? Yes. So I loved it to death a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard a little bit, but So are you are you listening, Marvel? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> let's get a, let's get a whole series, right? Uh, it was supposed to be a two book series, but the publisher, which was Delray Marvel, sort of canceled everything that they were publishing that season. And my book was one of those, or book two was one of those. And oh, yeah. so so Cassie, someday I'll, I'll secretly send you the script. <laughs> of what became of Kitty Pride and yeah. who she eventually hooked up with in the end. So, so uh, X Men Misfits, another one to add to the show notes, which will be at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG69. So, we are at an hour. So, uh, any anything going on at the library that we should be knowing about? Uh, it, we're coming up on holiday season, so well, programming probably thins out, right? Actually, the opposite. So, really? if people locally are looking for things to do when they're tired of being in the house between Christmas and New Year's holiday weekends, mm -hmm. we've got a lot of stuff going on. There's different crafts and other kinds of fun stuff. Nothing comic related that I know of. I'm doing like a rain cloud mobile workshop and then I'm doing decoupage. So all kinds of stuff all over the map. But no, we get pretty busy. 
people are tired of staring at each other in the house. So <laughs> I want to get out. And it's like, I don't want to go shopping anymore. Yes. So, uh, well, I know January 6th, January 6th, we've got the uh, Comics Artist Forum with Danny Jones is going to be the guest, the mm -hmm. guest speaker. And we're going to be rolling out a new feature at the Comics Artist Forum. Uh, Matt Dubay, I don't know if we're going to do it on the 6th or not. I hope we are. We're going to start doing StoryCore, right? We're going to start doing the uh, opening up. I'm the... not sure we're allowed to use the word story. Code, well, no. <laughs> but uh, one of the new features of Comics Are Great is we'll be uh, soliciting interviews from participants. Yeah, so if you come to the Comics Artist Forum, we're going to open up the Comics Are Great studios, and we're going to get book talks from uh, librarians cool. and from the kids and adults who attend the uh, Comics Artist Forum. That's uh, Sunday, January 6th, 2013, from 1 to 3 p.m. in the fourth floor meeting room at the downtown district library. Uh, you can come see the Comics Great Studios. So, uh, Raina, are you you're you're done touring, right? You are. Oh man, I was yeah. on tour from September first until December first, with a little bit of time at home, uh, but not much. So yeah. I am officially done with my tour and don't travel again until March, which I'm pretty excited about. Whoa, you get three months <laughs> off from traveling. <laughs> How did yeah, you arrange and, that? I mean, in that time, I have a lot of work to do, but I work best when I'm not distracted. So um, sure. the rest of this month is a wash because uh, Jersey's actually coming to visit us in like three <laughs> days <laughs> in New York. Um, and we have a bunch of other friends that are going to be around. And, you know, December, December is supposed to be for hanging out with your friends. And, and Dave and I are really looking forward to, to seeing people uh this this month but after that back to work <laughs> yeah yeah well i figured the three months were gonna be filled with work but uh but that's just that i mean after all the travel that you've done i'm sure you're looking forward to actually being in your house for a while right my house is awesome <laughs> it's awesome enough to be featured as the uh template for the home in night school that's so, right yeah <laughs> So, so uh, uh, I, I guess now is the time when I say uh, thank you, Cassie, for uh, flying co-pilot on this one with me. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. So you're welcome back anytime if you want to interview more cartoonists with me, okay? Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll try to do it at a more reasonable hour for your schedule, though. Or we can do it over the summer. We can do a, some I'm summer uh, episodes. <laughs> But no, that was I. Th I think he did an amazing job, Cassie. Don't you, Raina? I think she did. Really I good. totally think she did. I'm. I'm so glad we got to do this. Yeah. So, uh, so thank you for for you know co-hosting and also for helping to support uh, Raina's really really great book. And thank you, Raina, for making the time to be here and let us gush <laughs> over your work, uh, and 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 take it with grace and aplomb. But uh, if anybody is interested in buying this book, the best place to go, I think, would be GoRaina.com, yes, because that has all the links to different places where you can get it. Yeah, I mean, any any local bookstore is going to be your best bet or a comic yeah. bookstore. Um, but IndieBound.com is also a great online resource for finding uh, the book via independent bookstore channels. And if all else fails... It's cheap on those uh, sites that we won't give mention to, but <laughs> <laughs> those other sites, yeah. So go in that order, yeah. Yes. And all of those are linked to on my site, so yeah. GoRanda.com is kind of your your portal yeah. for everything to do with ordering my stuff. And I don't remember if I said this during the actual recording, but I bought copies for my in-laws. I think it makes a great holiday gift. I think uh, anybody is, I mean, everybody's gone through middle school, right? So it's like, it's not like nobody's going to look at this and go like, oh, it doesn't have anything to do with me. Well, you mm -hmm. went through middle school, didn't you? Cam one just died. Can you wrap it up? So, okay. So we got to wrap this up. And uh, thank you, Aaron Helmerich of the Ann Arbor District Library. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Matt Dubay, Eric Closter, Tom Smith, Eli Nyberger, everybody at the Ann Arbor District Library for putting the show on every other week. We'll be back in the first week of January. Happy holidays, everybody. And until next time, I have been Jersey Droz of ComicsGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. <laughs>